All right, let's start. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this exciting event. Uh, my name is Florian Karl. I'm the manager of the Yale Quantum Institute, and I'm delighted to see so many of you um, attend this non-technical talk um, presented here. So we usually would have you um, over on the Yale campus uh, for this talk, but uh, for the time being, all we can offer you, uh, offer you is the, uh, this seminar remotely, but we are delighted to have um, A. Douglas Stone, um, to give us this talk on quantum science and what led humanity to be on the verge of harvesting quantum computer power. So um, A. Douglas Stone is the YQI deputy director and also the, Kale, the Carl R. A. Morse professor of applied physics and professor of physics. He's the author of Einstein and the Quantum, the quest of the Valiant Serbian. Um, and you'll see that some of the content from the book will be uh, on, the, on the presentation tonight. Um, Professor Stone uh, presented this talk in Aspen um, at, in front of industry and uh, government agency leaders uh, in, the, in the last winter at the Quantum Summit. And we are very pleased to have this talk broadcast for all of you tonight and for the public, for all 145 of you right now who have joined the seminar. Um, the, the mandate of the Yale Quantum Institute is really to bring uh, quantum science and all our research and work to you and uh, to the public and explain to you what we're doing and how the, uh, this research done by so many students, postdocs, uh, and researchers in our labs will benefit uh, the general public in, in the world. Uh, before we start this talk, um, I would like to give you a few technical comments. Um, you will be able to uh, split the screen between the slides and the video, and you can adjust uh, the side of the speaker so you can see uh, uh, Douglas Stone uh, talk uh, in a second. And you can also type all your question in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will take your question uh, either during the talk, if they're pertinent right now, or we'll do a Q&A session afterwards. So feel free to type all your question in the back. The talk will be recorded and hosted on the Yale Quantum Institute website for replay. And without further ado, um, I would like you to uh, really welcome Douglas Stone uh, and have uh, a delightful evening. Hello, guests in cyberspace. Uh, I'm so pleased you could come and hear this talk, which as uh, Florian said, is supposed to be non-technical. So for the technical people who've been nice enough to uh, tune in and see me uh, do the best I can, uh, just uh, forgive me for oversimplifying things. Uh, and I, I'm very pleased that I can do this as a webinar where I, I get to speak in a room. Unfortunately, it's a room with one very socially distanced person here, uh, Florian. Uh, and uh, uh, it's much nicer than hunching over my screen for the Zoom conference, but I don't get to see your smiling faces uh, I don't get to hear your laughter, which I hope will be copious. Uh, and I, um, uh, I also don't get to see your bored or confused looks. So I'm just going to think positively about what's going on out there and, uh, and uh, go forward. So I wrote uh, a whole book about Einstein and quantum mechanics. And in the preface of that book, I said, um, I chose deliberately to be quite brief on questions such as fundamental indeterminism in nature and entanglement, which are very much actually the topic of today's uh, talk. And the question is uh, why? And the answer is pretty simple. Quantum mechanics is not rocket science. This stuff is really hard. It's really hard. It's really, really, really hard. So it's not something that I wanted to impose on the uh, unsuspecting public, uh, unless it was really necessary. Uh, so I tried to, I tried to avoid uh, many of the most challenging topics, which now unfortunately or fortunately are central to this talk. Uh, so um, this is, this is may some of, some of you may feel, but hopefully we'll avoid this. So why now? Well, the reason now that I'm venturing into this difficult territory is that uh, I show here a uh, map where the red dots illustrate new funding for quantum science adding up to about $15 billion. And I should say that there's been lots of quantum science since 1925 uh, going on, 
but this is a new type of quantum science, which we call quantum information science, and $15 billion of new funding, to put in perspective, the full budget of NSF in a year is $7 billion. So it's quite a bit. And you see that the big red dot there is China. And uh, China has made it clear that they're hoping to dominate the, the modern um, communications and information processing uh, technology sector. And so, um, you know, certainly they are putting a lot of effort into this, as is the United States and other places. Here's a, a list of corporate involvement in the United States of America uh, with, quantum, with quantum science. Uh, you see these four web uh, tech giants, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, as well as other well-known names, uh, and a number of startups. I want to make a shout out to Quantum Circuits, Inc., which is the local startup in New Haven, which uh, was founded by Rob Sholkoff and others. Uh, and uh, also abroad, there are this uh, bunch of famous uh, tech names that you can see here, including Alibaba, which is almost a trillion dollar web company in China. Um, and last, uh, about a year and a half ago, Jack Hydery, who was head of AI and quantum information science at Google X, came here, gave a talk, and when asked, said that quantum information science will be at least as important as AI in the tech industry, artificial intelligence, that is. And here's a list of, uh, of quantum, new quantum centers, all founded in the last five to 10 years. Uh, many of our peers uh, appear on this list, including the Yale Quantum Institute, of course, and uh, there are major international centers, which I haven't listed all of. And most recently, um, DOE has set up uh, a few quantum hubs around the nation, uh, and Yale is the co-lead of one in this part of the, the country uh, with all these other partner institutions listed below uh, for really focusing on the kinds of uh, technology we do here at, at Yale. Um, and this has, uh, I don't, yeah, it's $120 million in funding over five years and possibly renewable. Um, now, I wanna start by saying there was no field of quantum information science when I got my PhD. And to illustrate how long ago that was, this is a picture of uh, me on the MIT physics department soccer team, that skinny guy with lots of hair. So you can see that that was a while ago. Um, the things that were being studied then were the Higgs boson, gravitational waves, dark matter, and string theory. So all these cutting edge things you've heard about even more recently in physics were actually already targets for big chunks of the physics community uh, and astrophysics, et cetera, uh, then, but not quantum information science. Quantum information science didn't exist, but the precursors were people who worried about the philosophical foundations of quantum mechanics, the, uh, uh, that worried about the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, and a little bit about uh, irreversibility in the direction of time, very much fringe activities that weren't really, weren't considered uh, real physics. Okay. Well, now, of course, this is uh, accepted as maybe the most exciting uh, 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 frontier area in physical science and with a connection to computer science and mathematics. And uh, it just came out of left field in a way that I'm going to describe. So you can call that a, quanta, a scientific revolution or transformative but I think it's the most surprising and exciting development in physics in the last 50 years, in my humble opinion. Uh, so I felt we should try to engage the public about this quantum information science because it is so novel and it could be quite important as well. Um, so the outline of my talk is I'm gonna begin with a historical context. Of course, this is sort of my thing. Uh, quantum mechanics was invented as the theory of the microscopic world atoms, molecules, nuclei, the origin of light and heat, and it was developed between about 1900 and 1930. Um, and there were conceptual challenges with the new quantum theory uh, related to the idea of superposition and entanglement uh, of the effect of measurement and a changing paradigm for what existed in nature. Uh, 
But uh, in the maturing period between 1930 and 1980, there was great success, uh, but constraints uh, on what we could actually predict from quantum theory that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and uh, it was only in the 1980s that this radical fringe movement formed that began to study quantum information science. Uh, and then in the 1990s, there was a eureka moment uh, uh, which created this worldwide race to uh, perfect the technology and specifically to build a quantum computer, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, and then since 2000, there's been an effort to actually make this uh, a reality. The early work was all theoretical work, mainly theoretical work. Um, and actually the quantum computer is a new kind of machine, unlike any of the others we built, even using quantum mechanics to build them. Uh, and I'm gonna explain why it's such a new kind of machine. And then finally, I'll briefly talk about the social and economic impact of uh, quantum information science and technology. So in 1900, the exploration of inner space began. Um, through the 19th century, physicists and chemists had hypothesized that there were smallest constituents of matter, atoms and molecules, and were able to explain the property of gases and some of the properties of heat and the flow of heat using this point of view. And during that period, the working assumption was that um, there would the same laws of physics, of Newtonian physics and the electromagnetism of Maxwell and Faraday would apply also to these atoms, possibly with new forces that we would discover. Uh, and that turned out not at all to be the case. Um, so, uh, and this word quantum arose, and that's the first question one asks, why is it called quantum mechanics? Um, and it was introduced by Max Planck in, in 1900, uh, and he was trying to explain the vibrations of molecules which both act as a, as a microscopic source of heat and also as a source of thermal uh, radiation. And he was trying to explain the observations of this thermal radiation. And he was, able, uh, he was able to explain that only by assuming that the vibrational energy was quantized in a smallest unit epsilon. We physicists are contractually required to use Greek uh, letters here to make it sound more uh, you know, fancy. Uh, so epsilon is the smallest unit of energy, nu is the frequency of the of vibration, and H is this new constant that Planck discovered called Planck's constant. And because of this quantization, this vibrating molecule was assumed to only be able to take certain energies equal to an integer number times H nu. And uh, this is uh, may not immediately strike you as being totally crazy, but it is totally crazy in a certain sense. So the macroscopic analog of this simple oscillator would be a pendulum, right? And when the pendulum is just facing down, let's say it has its minimum energy, just potential energy, no, no kinetic energy. And then when I displace it and let it move, it gets kinetic energy along with the potential energy. And um, the more I displace it, the more kinetic energy it's going to get. Uh, so it looks like the energy that I can give to this oscillator is, is related to the continuity of space and must be con continuous because it seems like I could displace by any amount. But the implication of Planck's hypothesis was that that's not the case, that actually only certain magnitudes or amplitudes of vibration were allowed, something totally outside of Newtonian physics. Uh, now, uh, the young Einstein showed up and he uh, contributes to this. Planck had not embraced the, his hypothesis as a new law of physics that would change mechanics. But Einstein very much did. And in 1907, he wrote the following words. For although one has thought before that the motion of molecules obeys the same laws that hold for the motion of bodies in our world of sense perception, we must now assume that the energy of elementary structures can only assume the values zero, h nu, two h nu, et cetera. Okay. Now, related to this, he had introduced, uh, so this was, a, as I say, a radical violation of Newtonian mechanics, and it hints at a coming revolution, which Einstein was embracing. And in fact, in 1905, earlier he had proposed thinking about Planck's work that uh, actually the light itself could have a particulate 
behavior and that could be thought of as consisting of little particles, each with energy h nu, which we now call the photon. Uh, so, and that's sort of, you know, that, that introduced this strange idea that light could at once be a wave and a particle because light interferes with itself. And it also, um, uh, you know, we have a, we had a theory of light waves, not of light particles. So Einstein eventually embraced the idea that there was going to be a new theory with wave particle duality, which is indeed what happens. Now, one of the interesting things is that quantization appears somewhat naturally for waves when they're confined. Okay, so for example, if I tie a string at two points and I uh, vibrate it, uh, then all of its vibrations can be reduced to certain quantized vibrations with uh, a fundamental half wavelength and then the next overtone with a full wavelength and then three halves and so on. And this is the harmonic series that a lot of people know in music. Um, and there's a natural quantization. You cannot have frequencies in between these allowed harmonics. So if there was wave particle duality, maybe that could lead to, to quantization. Um, now, actually, Einstein focused his research mainly on quantum theory, not on relativity between 1907 and 1911. And by the end of 1910, he gave up. And uh, he wrote, the riddle of radiation will not yield. So, uh, uh, but just at that time, actually, all the other people who had not quite recognized the looming crisis uh, in physics, they realized there was a crisis. There was this famous first Solvay conference in November 1911 on the topic of radiation and quanta. Um, and uh, there you see uh, Mr. Solvay, this wealthy industrialist who paid for this. Um, uh, not unlike events now at the Aspen Institute, et cetera. And uh, there's, there's Einstein. Uh, but actually, he was very disappointed because he'd already run into a brick wall and he wrote to his friend Michele Besso that the conference was like the lamentations on the ruins of Jerusalem. I did not find it very stimulating because I did not hear anything that I did not already know. So, so uh, the next person then to, to really make progress was Niels Bohr, who actually found out about this Solvay conference from Rutherford. Um, and uh, he introduced this model of an atom where again, you had quantization, but this was quantization in terms of different orbits. Now it was known by that time that the, new, that the atom consisted of a nucleus, which was positively charged and negative electrons. And you could think of them orbiting in a kind of solar system model. But of course, in, in classical physics, the orbits could have any radius, but Bohr proposed with some justification, some, some argument, not completely rigorous, that only certain um, orbits would be allowed. And the only thing that could happen is that an electron could jump between these orbits, emitting energy, h nu, in the form of light. Uh, and the interesting thing is he could calculate these energy levels, and they were not equally spaced like this harmonic oscillator that we were just talking about. And so this spacing of the energy levels depends a little bit on the nature of the forces involved and uh, uh, the E equals H nu was, was just true for a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and now we knew how to calculate the energy levels of atoms. Okay, and because you have different uh, spacings, then that means different frequencies of light can be emitted from the atom, but they're discrete frequencies. Um, but this orbit picture turned out to be wrong. It took 13 more years to, to really come up with a, a more quantitative theory, which is essentially the modern theory. This was done mainly by Heisenberg and uh, Erwin Schrödinger, uh, and they replaced this orbit picture with the picture of clouds of probability. There was this idea that a state for an atom would be not an orbit, and that the, that the electron was actually could be in some sort of cloudy region uh, with a particular kind of uh, uh, a variation of the cloud, depending on how much energy it had. Uh, and it's related to this thing called a wave function we'll be talking about a little bit. Um, and in this case, the position of the electron in the wave function is uncertain. You'll find it in different places when you measure for the same state. But, uh, but if you measure the energy, you'll always get the quantized energy. 
And on the, in this talk, and for what we're going to do in quantum information today, I'm going to mostly focus on variables that are discrete, like the energy here, that can only take quantized values. Okay, so we're moving right along with quantum mechanics. So, um, so one thing that followed from the theory that was invented in 25, 26, 27 was that when uh, an atom was emitting light through this quantum jump, that it could actually be in between the two states in a state called a superposition, which we write this way. So psi is this wave function and it's proportional to a, a, an equal sum of the two states. And I'm being very vague mathematically here. Um, but the meaning of this superposition, at least partially, was that when you measured the energy of the electron in this superposition, 50% of the time you would get the, uh, the, the energy level E2, and 50% of the time you'd get the energy level E3. <clears throat> okay, and you also can have unequal superpositions, like you could have something with a half there, and that would correspond to finding E2 75% of the time and E3 25% of the time. Okay, um, so, so far, maybe that's not too upsetting. Now, to talk about this in an information theoretic way, we're gonna replace the two levels by uh, a, a zero and a one, as in the states of a bit, which we're gonna call a quantum bit, uh, but this is a bit that can be in this uh, superposition state. And while every quantum system has usually many energy levels or an infinite number, in actual using it for information processing, we're often gonna focus on just two levels or a few. And so, you know, this we, we talk about this quantum bit as if there were only two levels until the other levels start to come in and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, move away from that. But mainly we're gonna talk about quantum bits. Now, uh, measuring a quantum bit in superposition, is this just the same as measuring a coin that's been tossed inside a box, right? So it's, let's say, you know, it's a 50-50 superposition. So I toss a coin inside a box. I, I don't look at it yet. And then when I open it up, I have a 50% chance of getting tails uh, or I do it again, 50% chance of having uh, heads. Uh, so, um, and then an unequal superposition could be just like a biased coin, you know, which is somehow loaded to come up more like heads and tails. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, more heads than tails. So where's the big philosophical problem with a biased coin? I mean, that doesn't sound like a total showstopper. Okay, well, here's where it starts to get uh, more challenging. Okay, so uh, I do this, I don't look at it. So there, uh, but, uh, and then same thing, I do it again. I get some value for heads of heads or tails. Uh, but when I finally open the box, I'm able to assume that before I opened the box, it had the value before I actually could see it, quote unquote, measure it. So the inability to predict heads or tails when I toss a coin is a matter of ignorance. You know, I don't know what it is. If I don't look at it, I don't, but it was that before I measured it. Uh, so measurement just reveals the state that was there before. Uh, now you can't say this for quantum bits. It really is not true uh, insofar as physics can talk about truth. So that's where things start to get complicated. And now I'll try to explain why. Okay. So the usual coin would be, you know, 50, 50, we're going to call it zero in one state. Uh, uh, but you know, if it's biased, I could have a totally loaded coin that's completely always comes up head or always comes up tails, or I could have anything in between say comes up two thirds uh, tails and one thirds head. That's, there's nothing surprising. And all the different kinds of probabilistic behavior are on this line here. Uh, but qubit states are not like that, okay? We, this equal superposition I showed you is like the 50-50 unbiased coin, but I can write a different quantum state where I put a minus sign in front of, in front of the state one, and that'll also be 50-50 when I measure it. And then there are nastier ones that I'm not showing you that involve complex numbers. And in fact, there's actually an infinity of unbiased coins. And the states of a quantum bit, uh, uh, you know, can't be described by a line. They have to be described by this sphere where always having one, the totally biased coin is the two poles of the sphere. 
okay? And the two states I just wrote here would be, uh, would be states, uh, would be on the equator of the sphere and the equator is a circle. And so there's a continuum of unbiased states, all of which are distinct. And then you can ask the, you know, when you measure the energy, they're still gonna be 50-50, okay? After you measured the energy, if you get one, it's gonna stay one till something else manipulates it. So the measurement has changed the state. It's now completely one, even though it started out in that state, it was 50, 50, one and zero. Okay. Um, so what makes these, all these different unbiased states on the equator of this uh, sphere, different states? Well, you can tell they're different when you measure something else, which is not the energy. And to keep life simple, we're gonna assume you measure something which is uh, discrete and can just be zero or one, but a different meaning of zero one, some other physical property like momentum or something else, angular momentum. Um, now, the, these states on the equator won't be unbiased when you measure this other property, and the bias will not be the same. So they're not the same state, and, uh, and, and they don't map onto just a biased or unbiased coin. Okay, so do we really have to accept that the state is uncertain until we measure? Could we still interpret our observations as learning what was already there, which is certainly was from the very beginning the question that people uh, asked because they wanted to think of physics as objective reality independent of measurement. Um, so the answer is no, we can't, say, we can't do that. Uh, it seems like in quantum mechanics, the measurement is affecting the system and making it choose properties. Uh, the properties are not independent of the actual measurement. Uh, and Bohr responded to this by saying, get over it. This is known uh, more formally as the Copenhagen <laughs> Uh, uh, interpretation or complementarity. And he just says, your choice of measurement just determines what you can know. And there are questions that don't have an answer. You shouldn't expect them to have answers. Uh, later, it was actually proved that any new theory which assumes properties of quantum bits that are independent of how they're measured could never agree with all the predictions of quantum mechanics. And Bohr was, I'm fine with that. Okay, but not Einstein. So Einstein famously in 1935 wrote this paper with two young colleagues at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, called Can the Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? And um, in it, he, he did a thought experiment, he liked those, um, in which uh, he tried to argue that it can't be considered complete. And this, the reason that he argued was related to the, con the, the, his argument was related to the concept of entanglement. So entanglement is, again, I have two qubits that I, I don't know what their state is. Okay. And, but I put them a state that has the property that if I get there are two of them and they're in a joint state. And if, when I measure them, if I know what one is, I immediately find the other one has to be the same. So that their, their values are called entangled. Now, each coin separately is unbiased and just comes up 50-50 as entails. But as soon as I, if I measure the second one, actually it has to be the same. These are these magic coins also known as EPR pairs after uh, Einstein and Boldar, Podolsky and Rosen. Uh, so, and they look like this in our notation. So you either get one and one or zero and zero and you never get um, zero one or one zero. Um, <clears throat> so each coin individually carries no information because it's not biased, but the correlation does, the entanglement does carry information because you know something about this. In this state, zero one will never happen and one zero will never happen. So you have one bit of information, but it's, it's shared between the two bits. Now, the thing that makes it even worse and that Einstein particularly objected to is the following. Suppose I have these entangled uh, state and I take one of the bits and I let it fly off a great distance like a light year or something like that and then I do the measurement here and I find heads. Well, since you have to get <laughs> um, you have to get heads on the other bit that's far away and you know if I measured it first, um, you know, I it, it would have been random so, you, it sort of feels like this measurement here affected the measurement over there. Now, it turns out you can prove you can't send information. 
this correlation. So you can't go faster than light. But still, it looks very impossible or very wrong. And uh, so how can a measurement here affect the, the result there? Einstein said it can't. Sometimes he would make fun of the whole idea of measurement uh, affecting reality by saying, do you really think the moon isn't there when you aren't looking at it? Um, uh, <clears throat> and he thought there must be a better theory where only things near each coin determine what their value is. And somehow he can still explain the correlation that exists. So this brilliant young theorist back in 64, John Bell, actually took up Einstein's challenge, said, could there be a better theory? Is that even allowed? And he figured out the, the following theorem. Okay. Uh, so, um, so in his theory, he calculated the correlation between two measurements of qubits. I'm not going to go exa into exactly what kind of measurement that would be, but it's similar to checking, uh, you know, which state it's in, but it's a little more complicated. And he calculated how this correlation would vary with a certain angle that you vary in the measurement. And you see this blue curve I'm calling quantum. And uh, that's the prediction that quantum mechanics gives for this measurement. And the red curve Bell established is the, the, the uh, largest values you can have from any theory that Einstein would like that only depends on the local variables. And so he said, just go out and look at this and see if we violate this inequality if we don't, then quantum mechanics is wrong and the Einstein friendly theory could be there, could be found. But if we, if we do violate this inequality, um, then we could never explain it with the theory that Einstein would accept. And uh, so that's the difference between these, at this particular angle, this difference. Uh, if we see this, Einstein is wrong. If we see, oops, if we see the, the, the red, then uh, maybe Einstein was right. And this young French physicist, Alain Aspect in 82, did a very good experiment to test this. There were some earlier ones, but this certainly was one of the very best first early ones. And there's his curve, and you see it looks like a blue curve. And it violates what are called Bell's inequalities. So that means we'll never be able to get the kind of theory that Einstein uh, was looking for. And we really have to accept these weird properties of entanglement. And really, many, many experiments have been done and you know, this kind of thing has been verified in different forms over and over again. So the consensus is that the world is really this weird. Yes, the world is really that weird. Okay, now Bell really was kind of upset by this and he wrote Einstein was the rational man. The reasonable thing that he thought just doesn't work. So he was hoping that maybe uh, you'd find a problem with the quantum prediction, but we didn't. Okay, so to summarize, we've learned quantum mechanics, right? Sort of. Quantum systems can live in an uncertain state called a superposition. Two-level system of these uh, then is considered a qubit. That's a certain kind of superposition, uh, which we've talked about uh, a lot. Um, and any quantum system, when you measure it, 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 it decides what state it's in. It collapses into a state with a certain value of the thing you measured. The probability of each state is determined by what the initial superposition was. So it won't always be the same thing. Um, it's contradictory to assume it always was in the state you measured before you measure it. That's the toughest part of it in a certain way. Um, so this uh, physicist, uh, Alexei Karatkov said, in quantum mechanics, you don't see what you get, you get what you see. So, um, Finally, qubits can be in this perfectly correlated state while still behaving individually random. And this is an example of entanglement. Okay, and the state looks like that, or in coins, it looks like that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> All right, so we're good here, right? We've mastered quantum mechanics. Um, we've done it though. We've done it. Okay, test tomorrow. Come to this link. Uh, so we've covered most of the hard stuff, okay? And now we're gonna understand quantum computing, quantum information a little bit. So much later in 1927, there was the fifth Solvay conference and uh, Einstein was there looking like the more familiar Einstein. There's Bohr, there's Heisenberg, there's uh, Schrodinger. And then there's this guy whose name was Paul Dirac. Paul Dirac actually right after Heisenberg 
kind of put quantum mechanics in an extremely elegant form and predicted new things that nobody had, had the, the other people hadn't figured out and was generally considered to be a, a genius. Um, and he said in 1929 that the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. This is a famous quote. The rest of the quote is often not uh, given. And he says, the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. It therefore becomes desirable that practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed. Well, for the next 50 years, quantum mechanics turned out to be the theory of everything. And nobody really wanted to worry about these foundational issues and philosophical issues. And there was this acronym SUAC, shut up and calculate, which was in force when I started my PhD, um, for sure. So you weren't supposed to worry about these things if you were serious about physics. Um, now, uh, but the dirty secret was we know the equations that would describe many uh, complex systems of atoms and molecules or even subatomic particles, but we often can't solve them. Okay, and this is due to something that I call the, the exponential wall. Now, um, because of the pandemic, people are familiar with exponential growth. <laughs> like you infect one person and each person there infects you know, uh, uh, one more, you know, one more, so two turns into four, into et cetera, et cetera, and it grows uh, very quickly. Um, so, uh, so it turns out that the equations of quantum mechanics are sort of like that in the sense that as the system gets more complicated, uh, first with the simple system, we can actually solve it with pencil and paper and give exams to undergraduates, expecting them to be able to do that. Uh, and then as it gets more complicated and you have two atoms or three, uh, then we turn to a computer. Uh, but if we really try to solve them exactly for, I don't know, the, any medium sized molecule, and we, we do that using a ordinary digital computer, there is a brute force way to solve these equations. They're called partial differential equations, but we find that as the number of atoms and molecules increase, the time that it's going to take our computer to crank out the answer is um, growing. And pretty soon we're estimating that it's going to take the history of mankind and then the history of the earth and so on. And so there's no way to directly solve those that we know prior to quantum computing in human time scales. Now, in many cases, we've found approximate methods that avoid the exponential wall and seem to agree with nature. So we've made a lot of progress. But in the cases where we don't have a good approximation, we can't predict anything. So that is, that is the dirty secret. And this really uh, describes many of the frontier problems in theoretical physics that we're trying to get around the exponential wall. Okay, now uh, getting back now to quantum information, okay, uh, one of the few famous physicists who was involved with the quantum information fringe was Richard Feynman. I hope many of you have heard of him. And uh, in 1981, actually I was there, but I didn't know about this conference. Uh, there was a conference on the physics of uh, computing and Feynman came and gave the keynote address such as it was. And he said, uh, okay, now the, I'm, I'm blocking here actually the quote, but you can see it. Can you simulate, uh, simulate nature with a new kind of quantum computer? It's not a Turing machine, it's a machine of a different kind with quantum computer elements, meaning the hardware itself was in a quantum state of superposition or something like that. Uh, and uh, so he says, it's not a Turing machine. It's not a what we now would call a classical computer. Well, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want a simula simulation of nature, you better make it quantum. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look too easy. <laughs> so that's how Feynman talked. Um, and he realized that, you know, maybe this would get around the exponential wall. But this seemed like a crazy idea, right? Because we've already told you that quantum bits exist in an uncertain state. I haven't even told you how fragile they are, but even if you have them, if they're in a superposition, you know, they, they, they may randomly fall into one state or another. Uh, so you can't even re reliably store your bits. Why would you want something that's, a, uh, uh, you know, could be a zero or a one? Um, so, 
forget about processing in some predictable way to solve a problem. You are introducing noise and loss of information at the basic hardware level. How could that be good? Um, but as these people thought, what if quantum weirdness is a feature and not a bug? And the basic idea of quantum simulation is that if the components of your computer can keep their quantumness and are hooked up and are programmed, so do they have the same kinds of interactions and forces as the atoms in a molecule, say, that you're trying to uh, calculate the energy levels of, uh, th then just by running your computer, there will be a way to extract the energy level that you can't actually do with a, a normal computer just as a, this is just a quantum analog simulator. Now I must hasten to say that none of our computers before ever had quantum components in this sense. Okay, so if you did this, it turns out there would be no exponential wall um, and you would be able to uh, treat much larger quantum systems predictably. So throughout the eighties, scientists explored the properties of quantum information and interesting things were found. You can find a history there on Wikipedia but really the big, the big moment was in 1994. So 1994, Peter Shore, who was an applied mathematician and computer scientist at Bell Labs at the time, uh, uh, he uh, proved, uh, uh, he was looking at this and quantum calculations aren't the only exponential walls. So as an applied mathematician in computer science, he was interested in other exponential walls and he had heard about this idea of a potential quantum computer. Um, and he showed that a quantum computer could solve a computer science math problem with a, uh, uh, an exponential wall, which it was believed to have an exponential wall. So in other words, it wasn't just a way to simulate quantum mechanics and do physical science calculations. It was also a way to solve problems in applied math that could apply to finance, to cryptography, et cetera, uh, where exponential uh, walls are everywhere in networking and communications and so on. Um, here's an example of a non-physics exponential wall that probably you can relate to. This is somebody's estimate of the days of computer time it would take to crack a password of different length in terms of letters. So your desktop can do up to five letters and then it's gonna start taking much longer than you're willing to wait. Uh, a, a graphical processing unit, which is very fast for gaming, it can go up to six. And then an Amazon cloud cluster can go up to seven or eight. And it's very clear that if you have 20 letters in your password, you're never gonna get there. So this is nothing to do with physics. This is These are problems in information science or in cryptography rather, that we want to know the answers to. Okay, uh, so Shore showed that if you had an ideal quantum computer with perfect qubits and other things perfect, uh, you could break the standard encryption technology which underlies web browsing and e-commerce on the internet. <laughs> so this was a moment, <laughs> this was a moment that shocked the world uh, okay, so what am I talking about? Um, so cryptographers like exponential walls, particularly if they're one-way walls. That is that one way, it's very hard to find the answer, but the other way when you decrypt, it's easy. Um, and factoring large numbers into their primes is a convenient one-way wall. Mathematicians and computer scientists knew this, and it's used in something called RSA encryption, which is used to send your credit card on the internet. Uh, just to remind you what a prime number is and uh, a little bit about them. Uh, so, you know, 20 is one times two times two times five, a prime, well, okay. Uh, 21 is as shown there, 22 is as shown there. Um, uh, and uh, a prime number is, I didn't show itself as a factor, I should have. Uh, a, prime, a prime number has no factors but one and itself. And I'm sure most of you do remember that, I hope. Now you might think, well, you know, we kind of just look at this and we figure this out. And it's true. We could do that for not too big numbers. Uh, but if they're really big numbers, then it's not easy to do. So try and factoring this guy. So this is not a randomly chosen number that I typed. This is RSA 2048. Um, it's a 617 decimal digit, 200, 2048 bits uh, integer which is semi-prime, I'll explain that, what it, it, so it's not a prime number. 
And um, it's, uh, it's one of the largest, longest numbers that they use in this encryption scheme that I'm gonna tell you about. And they offered many years ago, $200,000 to uh, factorize this number. Uh, and as Wikipedia says, it may not be factorizable for many years to come. So RSA 2048 has only two prime factors other than one in itself. Uh, so P times Q multiplied together gives us this long number, but it's very hard to figure out P and Q. Okay. And actually still no person or computer system on earth can find that, this, the factors P and Q of this number, except the people that constructed it, who hopefully aren't revealing it. So, you know, you could offer somebody billions of dollars. There is, this is an unsolvable problem, we believe at the moment with the, the, the finest uh, techniques we know. Um, so the, you know, the team at RSA found P and Q by to find large primes and then they multiplied them together. And there is a way to find large primes. Um, so multiplying is easy, right? That you could even probably do, although you probably made a mistake with this long number, but a computer can do that easily. But figuring out the prime factors is believed to be exponentially hard and have an exponential wall. So there's a one way wall, it's easy to compute and knowing P and Q it's quote unquote impossible to compute. Q, P and Q knowing N. Okay, unless you have a quantum computer post shore. Okay, now the way this is often illustrated is uh, we're going to send a message that we want to encrypt between Bob and Alice, and each of those know the factors of N. I'm not even sure they both have to, but I, I'm just assuming that. Okay, this is my Bob's credit card number. So he sends it by encoding it in a message of bits that depend on N, okay? And he sends that message over and then knowing uh, the factors of N, Alice can decode it and get uh, Bob's credit card number. And if Eve is listening, she's an eavesdropper or, you know, uh, has, has corrupted the, the security of the line, she will get M and N, but she won't be able to find the prime factors and she won't be able to decode it. And this is literally one of the main ways that the internet allows you to send your credit card uh, securely. Uh, so when Shore happened, Cryptarger first braced for a quantum revolution. And by 2015, the US NSA had revealed its intention to transition to quantum resistant protocols, meaning that we won't use RSA, we'll find some other method that so far we haven't figured out if a quantum computer could break, okay. But we're still using it regularly and we don't have a quantum computer unless something very surprising is out there that could, could break RSA at the moment. Okay. Um, so once the Shore algorithm was invented, the race was on. I mean, you know, intelligence, privacy, e-commerce, finance. I mean, all these things care about uh, being able to crypt and encrypt and decrypt and so on. Uh, and suddenly there was this paradigm shift. Quantum uncertainty wasn't always a barrier to learning about nature. Actually, it could be the key to uh, extracting previously inaccessible knowledge. And you had to invent new hardware, which would qualitatively change uh, the, 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 the type of the problem. So before we thought uh, that pro if a problem was exponentially hard on one type of computer, it would be exponentially hard on any kind of computer. But according to Shor's result, that's not true. If you have the new revolutionary quantum hardware, this exponentially hard problem could uh, become solvable. Okay, now it turns out that all quantum speed up derives from superposition and entanglement. So if nature wasn't like this, we could never solve these problems. It would forever be outside of reach. Um, and it uses everything Einstein hated about quantum mechanics. So there's quite a historical irony there. Um, and it's a new kind of machine, uh, never previously attempted in science and technology. So let me try to explain how it could be in some sense so much more powerful, although this is a very simplified illustration. So uh, this is a conventional computer uh, a RAM chip with a uh, hundred billion bits on it. Um, but, and each bit has two states. So there are two to the n states uh, that, uh, that this, this chip could hold. 
two to the 100 billion is an insanely large number. In fact, 300, two to the 300 is actually an insanely large number. Uh, it's 10 to the 91 states. Uh, so if we were to explore all states sequentially at one nanosecond, so we just turned on this chip and started you know, with all zeros and then flipped one and then another and just did this once a nanosecond, okay, it would take greater than the age of the universe. Sorry. Uh, uh, it would take longer than the age of the universe to just do this um, in, uh, you know, in a serial classical way. But in a quantum computer, it would take uh, less than a second. So we start with all zeros in the quantum version and we don't flip one. We actually superpose it. We turn it into an equal, equal superposition of zero and one, which is something we know how to do. Okay. And then we do that for the next one and the next one. And eventually when we've done that 300 times, we actually have all 10 to the 91 terms in this big sum, all of which are now being partially implemented in this uh, 300 bit quantum register. So in that sense, it does something completely impossible classically uh, and, um, but very doable quantum mechanically. Um, and this would take less than a nano, uh, than, than a millisecond actually on a quantum computer, we think, we don't have one yet. But So the quantum computer is the ultimate parallel processor, uh, but it may also be the most difficult technology we've ever tried to build. So why, why is a quantum computer insanely difficult to build? Okay, classical bit is high or low voltage in a small circuit and the bit can just stay there uncorrupted for years or a magnetic region and a magnetic disk, whatever. Uh, the quantum bit is a real or artificial atom with quantum levels, okay? So there's a real atom and there's an artificial atom. This is one of the ones pioneered at Yale where I have a superconducting structure that has energy levels and can be uh, treated as a kind of artificial atom, okay? But the unprotected qubit, if I just leave it out in the environment, it's going to just go away in a nanosecond. Okay, it just, uh, it just uh, uh, can't stay in some superposition. And the reason it can't is because being out in the world is in an environment where atoms are bumping into you, where light is coming in, radiation is coming in, and it's measuring the qubit and it's making it decide what state it's in. Even though humans don't measure it, the environment is measuring it. So that's why quantum information is incredibly fragile. This effect is called decoherence. And that's why we couldn't have a real Schrodinger cat because anything big and living like a cat is interacting with the environment to stay alive. And so it's not gonna be in a superposition. Okay, but uh, so quantum information is like the most fragile kind of information ever, ever invented. Okay, well, that sounds hard, but can't we just shield our qubits from the environment and keep them far apart from each other? I mean, we knew how to trap individual atoms 20, 30 years ago. You know, we can cool things down. Can't we just do that? Well, that's not enough, okay? Because you need to interact your qubits to process. That's how you, you, for example, you need to create entanglement. So here's my qubit one that's in state one. Let's say I want to put it into a superposition. So I, I zap it with some microwaves or laser and I put it into zero one in a controllable way. Now I have to bring my next qubit in that's also in that superposition. Now I want to entangle it. So I want to get rid of the one zero zero one state. So they have to talk to each other and eventually I'll end up with the entangled state. So I had these interactions that have to go perfectly. Any mistake, I'm not going to get the right state. So this is so difficult that we think we will need error correction in hardware, which we do have in classical computers. You know, we store a one as three ones and then take the majority and so on. Uh, but it's much harder to do what possible to do in quantum mechanics. Um, now the current com quantum computers, they're basically two main technologies. The one that was pioneered here at Yale and other places involves the superconducting circuits that you cool down to a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. Um, and then these artificial atoms are on chips. They're little superconducting regions uh, that are particularly uh, 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 specially designed. This approach was pioneered by my colleagues, Michel Devere, Steve Gervin, and Rob Sholkoff. So I want to shout out to them. 
um, and this is called a transmon qubit, which pretty much all the industrial places are using now. Um, now, the other approach is to use real atoms, and in this blue thing here is a string of trapped ions, so ionized atoms, uh, which can be manipulated with laser beams and has to be kept in an ultra high vacuum. So, um, uh, so uh, that's all also extremely fragile, but okay. Uh, so we immediately see that quantum computers are not going to be small, they're not going to be portable, and they're not going to be cheap. But they are going to, you know, they, they, because they have unique capability, you can imagine that a quantum cloud would still be very, very powerful and uh, desirable. Now, uh, you might worry that while it's pretty easy to think that a single ion suspended in space is sort of uh, not near its uh, neighbors, you know, stuff on a chip where we have solids made of other atoms, you might say it's probably quite difficult to, to make that, that type of qubit uh, uh, avoid decoherence. And it was quite difficult back in the 90s when they were first proposed and demonstrated, uh, you had about a nanosecond before they became useless. And then uh, over uh, the last, uh, what is it, sort of 20-ish years, there's been a six order of magnitude improvement so that we can store quantum information on a chip. Uh, and uh, most of this improvement was done by people at Yale. Also the world leader in quantum error correction, which I don't have time to go into. So in the last three minutes here, let me say something about what quantum computing could do for mankind. So this is a picture of Einstein again, got to get him in there with his friend, Fritz Haber. And, uh, Haber invented something called the Haber-Bosch process in the beginning of the 20th century. And it's a way for, to extract nitrogen from the air and make ammonia. Ammonia is a very critical component of fertilizer. And this led to the green revolution of the second half of the 20th century. Um, and it's actually a very tough bond to break this nitrogen bond. So it's very energy intensive and it has to be done at 250 bars of pressure, which is the pressure two and a half kilometers under the sea and at 450 degrees centigrade, which is the melting point of aluminum. So uh, it's very energy intensive and uh, it emits a lot of CO2 when you do this. In fact, uh, the, uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, estimated that 1% uh, of total US energy for uh, gas um, uh, oil, it was it say, uh, nat energy and natural gas is used yearly just for the Harbor Bosch process. So 1% of all the energy we use goes into this and it creates a lot of CO2. So a grand challenge in quantum chemistry would be to figure out how we could do this much less energy intensively. And then here's this, uh, this cofactor called FOMOCO, which if you uh, let bacteria have it, uh, they can produce nitrogen from soil at room temperature and pressure instead of at the pressure of the bottom of the sea and so on. Um, and we don't know how they do it. It's too complicated. We don't know enough about the properties of this cofactor to figure out if we did, maybe we could, um, we could actually turn it into an industrial process and save an enormous amount of energy. Um, another example I like is something related to biomedical science and this case, these guys, Zells and Demler, they talk to medical biophysicists to ask, what could a quantum computer do for you? Since Demler seems to be married to a biophysicist, this was probably relatively easy. Um, and um, they talked about this metabolic dark matter. So we all know about genomics and some people know about uh, uh, catalog cataloging all the pro Pro, uh, the proteins, proteomics, but then the next level of functional things in the body are called metabolites, and there are 200,000 metabolites, and we only know what 1% of them do, and so on, and so um, uh, we'd like to know that, but the way we try to figure it out was by uh, shining NMR radiation on them and looking at the signal we get back, and this is very sparse information, and from this signal, it's very hard to figure out a complicated structure, okay? And uh, so this is how we're doing it now, but we can't do it that well. Um, and Zells uh, uh, and his coworkers designed an algorithm 
which uses a combination of pattern recognition and AI and quantum simulation to identify metabolites from spectra. Um, and it used the Shore-like speed up, the same thing that Shore used to speed up factorization. Uh, and they did some examples and uh, they were able to, to reproduce known spectra. And you might say, well, how did they do that? Because they don't have a quantum computer. And the answer is they, they only did it up to the exponential wall. And they're just hoping if we get a quantum computer, they can go through the exponential wall. But they're checking that the idea is working with a classical computer simulating a quantum computer. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to, uh, all I wanted to get across about how exciting and uh, uh, interesting the next phase is and how philosophically and conceptually important uh, the quantum information revolution is. Uh, so, uh, so we're going boldly into the quantum future and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we at Yale hope to be finding out what happens there. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, there's a lot of visual typing happening. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for this talk, um, Doug. Um, we have a question from Annie. You talked a little bit about what quantum computer could do. Um, can you uh, tell us uh, for, the question is, what kind of complex problem quantum computer have solved so far? Um, okay, I may, maybe didn't make this clear. So there aren't quantum computers really. I mean, they're very, very kind of rudimentary and people are using them, but uh, you know, at the moment we, we have uh, you know, dozens of qubits, not even a hundred that work together. They don't work together flexibly uh, and so on. So there is no quantum computer that's really doing stuff yet that's groundbreaking stuff. There are lots of little examples of things they're doing. The first thing people are doing is to try to, not the first thing, but one of the first things is to look at actual molecules um, because that's kind of a very natural thing for quantum simulation. And we have bigger quantum simulators than multi-purpose computers. So that's the kind of thing that's going on. But so far, it just looks really promising. Nothing's been shown yet. And uh, I guess the question that I have, and I have multiple questions on that, is uh, it doesn't exist yet, but like, when do you think it will happen? Uh, well, I'm not. So I think that's the, the million dollar question. <laughs> million dollar question. So, um, uh, my colleague Rob Shulkoff, I hope I'm quoting him correctly, I think, you know, it, it, to have something that you really can learn how to use a quantum computer and start doing things, which I'd say we're not even quite there yet, that's going to be only five years, maybe maybe less, um, the, the breakthrough, the, the ch you know, change in human society, the economy, I don't know, it, I don't think, it's either gonna fail massively or it's gonna be here in 20 years, but that's just my gut feelings, you know? There's been unbelievable progress made, so uh, that's my gut feeling. But this is all over the map, and a lot of people, you know, are saying it's already here, we're already doing it, you can buy our web services, you know, so you're going to hear all the big spectrum of uh, answers to that question. Um, are there any problem where even quantum computer can hit the exponential wall you were talking about earlier? Um, well, a partial answer to this. Well, first, yes, in the sense that we don't know the full capabilities of a quantum computer. And... So there are lots of problems that have exponential walls and we haven't figured out a quantum algorithm to solve them fast. And I don't know whether there's any proofs that they don't exist ones, but specifically the new kinds of coding problem, you know, coding they want to do, they're going to use another math problem, not factoring prime numbers, I'm sorry, uh, finding prime factors in large numbers. Uh, uh, they're going to use a different kind of hard math problem where nobody's come up with a quantum algorithm. And I think some people are much further along than me in understanding which ones can and cannot uh, be solved. But certainly there are many exponentially hard problems we haven't figured out quantum algorithm. Another thing I want to mention is that, uh, and this is now I'm quoting a very knowledgeable person from Microsoft, Matthias Troyer, who said that, you know, quantum computing is going to be good for hard compute problems. 
not for big data problems. So if there's some place in the program or in the, in the calculation where there's an exponential wall, you'll use a quantum computer. If you want to have massive storage and so on and be able to use it, uh, uh, actually, you, you, you're going to use a classical computer that's going to be easier in certain ways. So that's, that was his general take on it. So networking and the kinds of things that Google want to do is very much a hard compute problem. Uh, I'm glad you're talking about Google. That's a perfect segue to the next question. Um, Somebody is asking, um, what did Google do with the quantum computing, the, the quantum computer effort last year, and the quantum supremacy? So, and how's the, that different? The um, the idea uh, that emerged, which was a reasonable idea, was that well, you know, let's find a problem which. Um, a problem which has an exponential wall um, that may be the easiest problem for a to make quantum hardware for. And let's show that we can get an answer when no, uh, no classical uh, computer could. So it's not a, it is not a useful problem. And there's big arguments about whether it's even an interesting problem. I heard both sides argued recently here in the Quantum Institute, uh, you know, uh, but uh, but uh, it, it wasn't a practical problem. So they did um, so they did a uh, a kind of um, sorting problem. That's not even right. But uh, it, it's essentially a statistical problem where you had to detect a certain statistical behavior that was characteristic of interference in quantum mechanics. And you could try to simulate that problem on a classical computer, and they got to a size where no classical computer could do it. And they got an answer which looked to be measuring quantum interference. Uh, it was not dramatic. <laughs> it was the, the quantum mechanics predicted two and they got 1.06. Uh, and so their computer was not working perfectly, uh, but uh, they claimed that a classical computer couldn't have even gotten the 0.06. So it was a very abstruse uh, abstract problem that uh, you know they wanted to claim quantum supremacy. Uh, so, but I think the fact that they got so close is showing that we're making progress. And there are different um, approaches. Our approach here at Yale has been to try to do quantum error correction and do much cleaner quantum co computations with smaller numbers of bits and so on. And so that's the approach we've chosen. Other uh, Google's chosen one approach. Uh, IBM is more or less going more in our direction and so on. Um, so yes, it was a big deal because it did show something beyond what a classical computer uh, could do. Um, so in that sense, it's big, but it's a, a tiny, tiny inch above the threshold. I mean, it's not anything dramatic yet. Um, um, somebody asked the question, of um, I've noticed there's a lot of uh, uh, physicists um, working on these topics uh, with the background of in physics. What are the possibility for engineers in this field? So my understanding uh, from talking to Rob Sholkoff, the director of this institute, who founded the QCI, the, this startup company, it's... Um, oh, sorry, what do I need to do? Okay, sorry. Um, is uh, that actually more than half the people or half the people are engineers and software engineers and so on. Uh, so I think it's very clear that this is a field where we'll need lots of electrical engineers, computer scientists, uh, software engineers, uh, probably mechanical engineers. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, it, there's a lot of opportunity there. But the big barrier, the exponential wall here is that you have to understand something about quantum mechanics. And so we're working on educational, you know, courses that can take someone without a full physics background and get, you know, they could just use my talk, but it's probably not quite deep enough to, to, to do that. So yes, there will be a big role for engineers. And then we can also say that the Yale Quantum Institute regroups departments at Yale in physics, applied physics, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, chemistry. So there's, we're really trying to bring um, everybody. It, it's naturally uh, 
interdisciplinary. And also, at least for the moment, it's like a, 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 a seller's, seller's market. So anybody with quantum training that's legit, you can get hired maybe without you know, doing any postdoc or maybe out of your PhD, but we don't like that. So forget I said that. Um, anyway. uh, thank you. There's a lot more question uh, pouring in. Um, what in particular do you see uh, the YQI team contributing to the commit decades? Like what, what's next? What do you think that the Yale Labs will, uh, will bring oh, in the field? Oh, thank you. I don't yeah. know if this is a Yale person. It's an anonymous thing. Maybe somebody from Yale is sending us that, like a, a low ball question for us. But <laughs> really okay. it. So I didn't want to be too parochial, but uh, I think that uh, I mean, Yale deserves a lot of credit, both for inventing a lot of the foundational stuff, but for taking a completely different and very patient, uh, systematic approach. And as in, in, in doing that, they've actually changed the paradigm and only a few people, only a few other places. As of last year, no one with Yale was doing this. I understand now some other people are doing this. And they stopped... They would start it, stop using the superinducting circuits as their artificial atoms. And they started actually using photons, light in cavities. And I, I don't have a picture here, but uh, the, it doesn't look like the flat thing that I have here. Uh, right. The new thing looks like something you might have on your cable box. Yeah, it doesn't look like that flat thing that, I, that I, I have in this picture. It's much more like a, it's three dimensional and it, um, it's small, it's not as big as your cable box, but you know, it's, uh, it, it looks very different. And, uh, and that's because we're storing the information in light. And the reason we're storing information in light or in photons, actually microwave photons, um, is because photons don't interact strongly and uh, they have fewer ways that they can actually disappear. And so we've already shown that they can have 10 times longer uh, lifetimes than the superconducting qubits we used to use. So A, we, we hope to pioneer this method of using storage with photons and processing with superconducting elements, which is new, you know, it's unique to Yale and now, now spreading a little bit. And then the second thing is that we hope to have error correction, efficient error correction, way before anybody else. And I won't, I won't tell you, you know, it, it gets pretty technical why we think we are so far ahead, but uh, we have good reasons to think this. That answer a lot of question uh, in the, the Q&A regarding like the, the investment of China on quantum computings. They are, they are wondering what are the, uh, the implication of, of this and if they will have quantum computer before, but I think you've answered this question saying like, we, we hope that the, uh, the Yale team has something. Uh, well, um, also, I think that um, the, the idea of encryption and, you know, it's sending encrypted measurement me uh, messages is very exciting to the Chinese and lots of people, to be fair. And they've been really pushing quantum communication, not quantum computing. I guess they're catching up somewhat, quantum computing. And... Um, so, and one of the things I didn't get to say is that there is a proof that you can send unbreakable coded messages with quantum mechanics. And that is out there already and it's being sold commercially. And we don't know who's using it in defense. Uh, so I think they're very much interested in the secrecy, coding, decoding aspect of it more than the quantum computing at the moment. But that's just a guess. Um, and I think the, the clock is running and um, I'm going to maybe uh, end on this question. Uh, since we're a university, we have a question from a college student. Um, they, um, Willis is asking, like, what could um, a student do today to prepare for quantum computing in the future? What are the, the subjects or major you should consider? Is it better to do CS or physics? Like, what is, the, um, what is your take on, uh, on a young person who wants to, to join the, the efforts? Uh... I think that both are very good. So you should do what you like more. Specifically, Shore, who was not trained in quantum mechanics, but just kind of understood the math of quantum mechanics, was able to find this thing 
you know, that he knew stuff in computer science and in complexity theory that most physicists at that time didn't know. And, and he made the revolution, honestly. So I uh, started the revolution. So in that sense, you know, you can master the math uh, and do something as a computer scientist or applied mathematician. Um, uh, you know, being a, a physicist, if you want to work on hardware, that's definitely a good idea to be a physicist. Or if there are, are joint efforts between physics and engineering, you could be an engineer. You know, so th that would be an answer. I think either are promising. Um, there's also the, the, the question he had was like, um, he, he was worried about having uh, his work on computer science being obsolete by the time, the, since the field is moving so fast. Um, and so that's, that's the, that was also one of the, the concerns. And I think in that case, people are here are working really in collaboration. We, all talk, we talked a lot with the people in computer science here. And so I think the, the field is moving along. And um, yeah. so, and, yeah. And I, I also, I sort of said this, but I said it fast. And maybe it's a good thing to end on. You're not going to have a quantum computer in your phone. You're not going to have a quantum computer in your house. You don't need a quantum computer in your house. You're not always running up against big compute problems with exponential walls. Google is running up against them when they're trying to route signals and do, you know, do stuff over, you know, a billion links and so on. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not a replacement for all of the classical computing and software or anything like that. Um, so clearly, you're not going to be totally obsolete unless you're very interested in complexity theory. And even then, you won't be up obsolete, I suspect. I think we're going to end on that note. Thank you so much um, for uh, tuning in. Um, we have a lot of unanswered questions. They were actually very technical. So maybe in the future, we'll have another event like this for a slightly more technical approach with the Q&A system and maybe uh, a, a moderate uh, conversation. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. We can bring in people that know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but, um, yeah, you should uh, consider subscribing to a public event newsletter that you can uh, find on our website, uh, quantuminstitute.tl.edu forward slash subscribe. Um, thank you all uh, so much. And thank you, uh, Doug, for uh, taking the time to tell us uh, all about quantum computers. Have a great night.